All right, Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we left off at verse 3, and let me review a little bit of verse 3, then I'm going to review on verses 1 through 3. Now, I left off with a very deep teaching where it's your mind swimming, and I don't think I really made sense out of it. I do my best to try to explain and teach effectively, but within that short amount of time with quantum mechanics and Calvinism for knowledge, I don't think it does justice. So let me just uh, make it really... Uh, Make it more clear now. So in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, remember the verse is talking about that the worlds were framed by the word of God. <clears throat> in other words, all these worlds were shaped, created, formed by God's word. So when he spoke, the worlds came into existence. Now, there are two meanings to this, okay? I'll cover the other meaning later. But the crazy one, all right, so we always start with the crazy one because people like crazy ones, all right? So I'm not saying that is the right definition, but this is always being open. This is always being open to explanations there. I don't believe in being closed-minded. I believe in being open-minded and see if there is some rationality here, something scriptural here, then why not talk about it? So the worlds could be referring to where quantum me mechanics majors or, or physicists who dabbled into quantum cosmology, they say that there could be alternate universes out there, multi-universes. In other words, there are other forms of you, and you thought that's something like in a sci-fi movie, but actually physicists do seriously discuss those things. So in other words, whatever you, you've decided now, there could be another form of you who decided differently. And then the chains of event in that history will be much different from what we're experiencing right now. So in other words, see, the world that we're living under, our decisions, our choices, our free will that we made, made this kind of world, this kind of history. Do we follow so far or was that deep? But then let's say you made different choices and then other people around you made different choices then that world could come out differently, right? Same thing with this, 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 this. Physicists believe in evolution, right? So they believe it's not just us, but those elements within our universe could have been functioning differently, and perhaps those universes, those worlds come out differently. All right, do we follow so far? So that's the idea about quantum cosmology. Now, I mentioned here that in verse 3, the last part, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear, meaning that the visible, physical things that we see in our current universe, they're made, they're created by invisible elements. And those are, like I told you before, possibly referring to quanta. So that's where quantum cosmologists, physicists, are talking about subatomic particles before the Big Bang that created our universe. They like to try to argue for that because they don't want God to be in the picture. But before the Big Bang, before any physical element in our universe, who was there before all that? That's the problem with the scientists. They know they have to say God because it doesn't make sense that the physical elements in our current universe including gravity, it cannot be eternal. It cannot be eternal like that. They all had a singularity, a beginning. Even things, if you were to calculate where it can have an eternal lifespan, it all comes back to a beginning or what they call singularity. Scientists recognize that. So then what's before that beginning or singularity? You have to put God in there because there's no physical element or explanation you can put in there. So that's the reason why they like to put quanta in there because that can explain away God. But remember the problem with quantum, uh, quantum mechanics or quantum cosmology is that they have a thing called a universal wave function. Within this universal wave function, how you activate this thing where you can get your big bang and everything in your current universe is by two things. It, a person has to be there to see it. Yeah. Well, see, then they'll prove God more. 
Or a second thing, it has an encounter with a large macroscopic object. Well, then that proves God more, see? Why not both? There was a person, a large macroscopic object, who saw it. There we go, see? So Christianity, uh, so this doesn't explain away God, it just proves more of God. So we see right here that these invisible elements that you can't see, which they argue subatomic particles or quanta, that it's still connected to God. Now, I don't believe in this. A lot of it is just fairy tale la la land stuff. However, I do want to point out this. What I want to do point out is I think that the scientists, that they're onto something. Scientists, when they discover these things, they're just not making stuff up. They're basically getting into God's creation. They're studying into that. But they come up with such la la land conclusions, right? That's the only thing. So their conclusions are just la la land. But they're getting onto something. They're seeing something here. What if, so like I said, what if, that from God's breath, and that's where you can connect the vibrating strings or string theories or quanta particles, I don't care. But what if God was the one that spoke the worlds into existence and that's where quanta was operating? And if quantum cosmologists believes in different worlds, see that? You get the quanta activating with those worlds, as Hebrews 11.3 says, framed by the world of God, uh, by the word of God, not the world of God, the word of God. Those worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now, does that, am I saying that there are different worlds out there? No, I am not saying that, but I think that the quantum cosmologists, they're onto something. What they're onto is that not the actual existence of these worlds. I do not believe in multi universes, I don't think they really exist. But what they're getting into is God's foreknowledge. So, what I'm saying right here is these worlds where there's different choices made, where different histories get played out, yeah. the Lord already knows yeah. how any choice from everybody and any historical timeline, wow. even every element in our universe, if they were to play differently, how it would come out. Yeah. So that's what I meant by that, foreknowledge. Yeah. So in other words, when God spoke that with that quanta operating, his foreknowledge was already operating as well. Yeah. In that what? 0.5 second. That makes sense. That's good. Boom. Wow. Like that. That's cool. So that's what I think right here. This explains away Calvinism very easily as well. Because we now have something scientific as well to dabble into. Calvinists are all just la-la land stuff as well. They say that they think that God is so weak that for God to know what decisions you'll make, he'll have to force you to come out that way. No, then that shows a weakness of his knowledge. To prove his foreknowledge, he shouldn't force them to make those decisions to what he predicts. To prove his prediction powers, he should let those things play out to how they decide, how they want. So that proves his foreknowledge more. Okay, so that's explanation one, which was very interesting and also very crazy, okay? But I think it's on to something, all right? I'm not saying it's true, but I think it's on to something, like I said. Okay, what am I doing here? Um, the second explanation, which is not as crazy, but it is still crazy, okay? But it is scriptural. The worlds were framed. Go to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Do you know what the worlds are? World, if you look up in the definition, it's not just what people assume to be planets or spherical, uh, spherical earths or stuff like that, stars, etc. What worlds is referring to is a group of people who live in that earth or in that, I guess, planet or spherical object, whatever you want to call it. So that's what world is referring to. World is not just this spherical object that you see, but it's referring to people who live in it. Now that means then, think about it, if God spoke the worlds into existence, then that means there were different groups of beings who were inhabiting different planets throughout our universe. 
So I wonder who that could be, right? Keep your hand at 2 Peter 3. Go to Job. Go to Job. Don't forget those angels. It's the angels. Job 39. <clears throat> uh, Job 38, excuse me. Job 38. Notice that when God spoke the universe into existence, who was present at that time? Who was rejoicing at that time for God creating a world for them to live in? Look at this, Job chapter 38. The Bible says in verse 4, verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? So at the beginnings of that world, that earth, when God laid it out, notice, when the morning stars sang together and all the what? Sons of God shouted for joy. They were rejoicing when God created that world. Why would they? Unless they'll be living in it. Unless God is creating their home. See that? <clears throat> Notice they're also called morning what? Stars, right? Angels are known to be morning stars. Because these angels are morning stars, notice that star or planet is connected to the angel. Why? Why is that? Unless there is a connection with that angel and with that star or planet. And a lot of other stuff would then make sense about mythologies that believe in those gods who come from the universe, who live amongst different stars or planets. That would also make sense to uh, current things that you hear about, aliens who say they come from other planets. You know what they're all connected to? The sons of God. And more specifically, those are actually fallen angels. Those are demonic creatures. Because what they did was they rebelled against God when he created that universe for them. And when they followed Lucifer's rebellion, they fell because God drowned them out. And after that, excuse me, after that, God drowned them out with a universal flood. Go to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, look at verse 4. Look what God did at the beginning of creation. So this is at the beginning. Look at the beginning of creation. Verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the what? Beginning of the creation. All right, the writer's going to tell you what happened there. For this they willingly are ignorant of. So here's what you're ignorant about on what happened at the beginning of the creation. That by the word of God, remember the worlds were framed by the word of God, yeah. Hebrews 11, 3. So this is speaking about that timeline. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the wa water. So notice right here that the universe was created, heavens, plural. So this is a universal context. This is not the planet earth with the sky atmosphere. This is earth with its universe in context. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the what? World. See that? World. So that's the inhabitants. That then was being overflowed with water perish. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. So notice right here that... The, the beings who inhabited that world, and remember, world is both the planet as well as the people who inhabit it. That's what world means. So all of that was overflowed with water, drowned out. God gave a universal flood because notice right here, heavens were affected, right, at verse 5. So the entire universe was drowned out. God spoke the worlds into existence, and then you know what he did after that? He drowned it all out. He drowned it all out. And then at verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, 
So God is reserving by his word. His word is holding it together still. Yeah. His word created it. His word retains it. Yeah. And if all of the scientists believe that everything in our universe is made up from quanta particles, which comes from vibrating strings, and that comes from what? Yeah. His word. His word is what, like yeah. Pastor Reagan said, you remember that extreme he, example he gave? Right. If you don't believe in it, that's fine. So I'll call it an extreme example. Yeah. But there's a truth there. If you destroy this book, then you'll destroy everything in our universe. Yeah, glory to God. What? Yeah. yeah, glory to God. How about that? There's a lot of truth in there. Amen. A lot of truth in there. Mm -hmm. Now, these are worlds. These are places to be inhabited. So... The Bible says right here in verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So God is keeping, reserving that universe, the heavens, the world, for what? Destruction because of currently mankind's sin. So go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Now, you know what's very interesting? The interesting thing is that God's saving that universe for destruction due to what? Judgment of ungodly men. Yeah. Why that seems to indicate as if perhaps mankind is starting to colonize throughout the universe. Who knows what that Antichrist might be doing, right? Isn't that what scientists and the Vatican is talking about when they get in contact with the aliens? They might be able to find stuff where they can keep their planet alive or colonize other stuff? You see so much of these movies conditioning us for that one? So it's, it might be possible they can start living amongst those planets there. They're trying to colonize there. And then the Lord's going to destroy it all with fire. So it could be possible. It might happen during our time. I mean, you know Elon Musk, right? He's really trying to get up there. That's no secret. All right, Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Remember 2 Peter 3? God destroys all the universe at the end times, right? So in, in this passage, now God creates a new heaven and a new earth. So he creates a new universe now. And in this new universe, then that means according to... 2 Peter 3, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, if we were to go back to 2 Peter 3, notice at verse 13, the verse said, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. So Peter recognizes after the destruction of the universe during the end times, God is going to cr create a new one. Right. We saw that in Revelation chapter 21, right? Now, this verse says, we are looking. What does that mean? That means we're inhabiting then yeah. Amen. the world throughout our universe. Yeah. Another thing is because the context of verse 6, world shows beings that inhabit it. Meaning then that when God spoke these worlds into existence, listen, when he created that, what did he expect? Not just to be there. It's to be inhabited. Those angels fell messed up. So who's going to inhabit them? Us. He created it for us. That's why you want a nice mansion in a small acre of land in the San Francisco Bay Area? Really? Really? Do you realize what God prepared for us? And you want to miss out on that. All right, let's go back to uh, Hebrews 11. That was really good stuff. That was really good stuff for you and I to know. But that's not the one I'm excited about. All right, so here we go. The lessons on faith. I don't know how much I can cover. I already passed 30 minutes, so I probably won't cover all of it. Faith, remember, is the topic we're discussing. The author, he's trying to give examples throughout the Bible of faith that we can learn from. So meaning then, if... 
if Hebrews 11, he's demonstrating examples of faith we can learn from, then Hebrews 11 can be applied to both tribulation saint and church age saint, okay? okay? So I don't have to distinguish the two because basically whatever lesson we learn from each hero of faith in Hebrews 11, it's going to be the same thing for, a, for the tribulation saint in the tribulation. Whatever the tribulation saint learns from Hebrews 11, we in the church age can apply it too. It's going to be the same thing. So I'm going to apply it as a universal, okay, application. I'm going to apply it as if it's for tribulation and church age, okay? With faith, there are three important things you want to keep in mind. These three important things will help you know you got the right faith. A lot of times it's hard for us to figure out our faith if we're believing in the right things, right? Especially, especially during the storms of life and hardships happen and if you're following God's will or you're not really following God's will. So this is extremely helpful. One is verse one, hope. Number two is your testimony according to verse two. And number three, is the word of God according to verse 3. Notice that faith is what? It's something hoped for. The stronger your hope is, the more clarity you have in hope, then the more clear your faith will be, more clear your belief will be. You will be less confused. You will live less in doubt. So you have to strengthen your hope. You have to uh, critique. You have to... Correct, yeah, there we go, correct, validate more on your hope. And we'll cover that especially in Abraham's case, which is incredibly eye-opening. It'll be helpful. Yeah. Verse 2, notice right here, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Yeah. So this faith helps them have a good testimony. So how you know what you're believing is in the right thing is looking at your testimony, looking at the testimony of other people. That helps you know you got the right faith. What your belief is, is in the right thing. Now remember, faith is, a, faith is very difficult because according to verse 1, it's the evidence of things not seen. So remember, God doesn't show you stuff for you to see. So a lot of times you question yourself if the decisions you're making is right. You know what the number one thing I notice in counseling that I talk to people is? They can talk about bitterness, they can talk about family problems, they can t talk about trauma, but everything comes down to they're not really sure yeah. on the things that they're doing in life if it's the right decision or not, or the right feelings that they have. Everything in life, whether it comes to relationships with uh, significant others or whether it comes down to futures that they want to find for living scenarios or job, etc., everything comes down to that. We live in a world of much doubt. Do you understand that? For a place that boasts of science and progress, we, live, we sure live in times where they, they critique themselves, they have so much doubt and confusion more than ever before. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? That's the fruit of science. That's the fruit of modern education. So thank God for them, huh? You know, this is the mess you end up in. You wonder, and you wonder why Christians back in the old days had more faith than you and I. All right, so uh, clarify your hope, strengthen it, your testimony, is it good? Verse 3, obviously the Word of God. Through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God, right? So it's by faith, that Word of God accompanies it. So is it following what God says in His book? So these are the three things, and you're going to find that out when we come through the heroes of faith. Look how these three play out. And you're going to find other nuggets in faith that I'm going to be covering as well, which is these two, if we can reach those two, okay? So there's a lot of good stuff here. All right, stop saying it's good and just shut up and talk about it, Gene. Okay, let's do it, all right? So let's see we can cover, all right? Verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So we give the first example of faith is Abel. Abel believed that the sacrifice that he gave to the Lord, which you and I know, he offered a lamb sacrifice, 
it was a more excellent sacrifice than Cain's. Cain's sacrifice was his works. The next part, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So Abel was able to obtain a testimony right here that he was in the right for his sacrifice. Because why? God acknowledged it. It says right here, God testifying of his gifts. Meaning that God was the witness. God was the one who testified. God was the one that uh, provided the evidence, his, his part of Abel's gift that he offered as a sacrifice to God, which is the lamb. So God's answer was how Abel obtained the witness. Now, you might wonder, how did God answer Abel, right? How was God able to testify Abel's gift? How did Abel know after he offered a lamb sacrifice, oh, God accepted mine, not Cain, right? It's not like God would visi visibly speak from heaven. We see this case with Cain, but we don't see it with Abel. So let's find out. Genesis 4. Keep your hand here, Genesis 4. So God was the one who spoke to Cain, but he didn't speak to Abel, you have to realize, audibly. So how did Abel know that he received the right sacrifice? So first of all, let's go to Genesis chapter 4, and then your other hand to go to, uh, let's go one by one. Keep your hand at Genesis 4. We're going to come back here. Go to Judges 13. Judges 13. All right, while you're turning to Je Judges 13, let me read Genesis chapter 4. Notice right here that the Bible says in verse 4, And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But how do we know, right? It doesn't say. Verse 5, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. We know that God rejected Cain because he said it at verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou raw, and why is thy countenance fallen? See, so God responded. That's why Cain knew he was rejected. But Abel, it doesn't show that he responded. So how did God respond to Abel's sacrifice? It's by fire. Go to Judges 13. Judges 13. Usually throughout the Old Testament, if you offered the right sacrifice to God, an animal sacrifice, God will accept it by calling down fire from heaven and burning it. Do you now understand why Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal that how we know that the, your God is real yeah. by the sacrifice you built is if fire comes down from heaven? Yeah. See that? So go to Judges 13. We see this example here. Judges 13. Verse 19. Verse 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. Look at verse 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have what? Received a burnt offering. How did she know that God received their burnt offering? Because of that fire that came out of their offering. Okay, now go to 1 Chronicles 21. First Chronicles, keep your hand at Genesis 4, by the way. Oh, hopefully your hand's not out of there, all right? Go to First Chronicles 21, First Chronicles 21. And if your hand's out of Genesis 4, you might as well start working on that, all right? <laughs> David, when he offered an animal sacrifice to God, yeah. the Bible says word for word, the Lord answered. And then we see fire coming down from heaven. That's how it is. Go to First Chronicles chapter 21. And verse 26, verse 26. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. All right, now go to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. So we now know how God testified of Abel's gift. Testified, uh, gave an answer, witnessed, Abel's sacrifice. 
The verse says he gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Meaning right here that when Abel gave his sacrifice, he was more righteous than Cain. He was in the right more than Cain. But here's the problem. Cain, from a humanist standpoint, had every right to be bitter. He had every right to be bitter because he worked hard in growing vegetables and then gave the best of his vegetables and fruits to the Lord on the altar. Abel, all he had to do was kill a lamb. And Cain, he said, Lord, I sweated like a dog. I worked so hard. Why did you reject my sacrifice and accept Abel? What we're going to find out is that Abel, he was in the right, whereas Cain was in the wrong because God knows the heart. God knows the heart. So we're going to look at Genesis 4 again. Look what God asked Cain at verse 6. Go back to verse 6. Genesis 4, 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, see, meaning he didn't do well, shalt thou not be accepted? So he, there's something he didn't do well. So that's why God didn't accept him. And if thou doest not well, see, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. See, God knew what was going on at his heart. He had sin in there. The eye-opening answer is 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. Yes. You're on the spot. What's the answer right here? The answer is, it doesn't matter how hard you work, did you do what God tell you to do? See, what God wanted was a lamb sacrifice. That's throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And I don't care if you worked hard. The point is, God will not respect it if you don't obey him. Amen. Well, if I obey him, it's just too easy. I should work harder, so God should have better respect for me. No, no, that's a messed up Asian mentality. Can I say that? That's a messed up Asian mentality. I work so hard for you, so you got to honor me and shut up. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's a messed up Asian mentality. Just because you work hard and you do so much doesn't mean that you should get something back for it. What people would respect more, to be honest, is if you would do what they would ask you to do or what they would want you to do. <laughs> and you wonder why that there's so, such messed up scenarios going on <laughs> in our world. If God wants you to do something, he expects you to follow what he says, whether it be stand on your toes to get saved or calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't care about your work. He doesn't care about how long or how hard you worked. He says, no, obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. And that's the same thing with our Christian walk. I don't care how much you sacrifice for the Lord. He has absolute zero respect for you. He will treat you like he treated Cain. If you don't follow what he exactly told you to do. So 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. See, God doesn't care about sacrifice. What he cares about, will you obey what I tell you to do? All right, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. So we see one example of faith here. And that is just following what God told you to do. If you have not been following what God told you to do, that shows us how much you really believe in what he tells you to do. So that's the first thing you need to understand. Now, here's verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated. Oh, excuse me. I, I skipped the last part of verse 4. The last part of verse 4 says, And by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, God blessed Abel's faith so much that by his faith, even though Abel died, he was still able to speak. His death spoke aloud his testimony of faith. Why? Because Abel's death right here, it, his, sac, uh, his sacrifice that he offered, plus the blood that he shed, the Lord saw ahead of time, this can picture a lot what, what my son is about to do at Calvary. So go to Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter 12, where Jesus Christ sacrificed. It's a blood sacrifice, not a bloodless vegetable cane sacrifice. See that? 
And also, Jesus sacrificed his own life. Same thing with Abel. He, he died just like Jesus died. There's a great picture here that God recognizes. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible points out in verse 24, verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than what? That of Abel. God would use Abel as his typology to contrast himself with. No, he didn't name any other person. That shows how significant Abel's typology is for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that he would contrast that. All right, go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Now we're going to look at verse 5, verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Okay, remember, I'm explaining each and every word here. So look at that verse and see if my explanations match up. I tried to do that in the previous verses. So Enoch had faith, and because of his faith, he was able to be raptured so that he doesn't have to see death. He doesn't have to die. So translate. See that? It's kind of like uh, when you're talking about transatlantic or like trans communication, trans something, transport, what is that? Moving from one location to another. That's why rapture fits perfectly right here. Because rapture is where you're traveling from one place to another. So Enoch got translated. He got transported. He went on a, a more than a transatlantic flight. He went through the transuniversal and then went all the way up to heaven. Amen. Why? Because of his uh, faith. Because of his faith. The verse 5 says, and was not found. So that shows right here that his body was not found. Right. So he was truly transported. He was gone because God had translated him. The very reason he's not found is because God transported him. He raptured him up to heaven. For before his translation, he had this testimony. This is important. Before he got raptured, there's a reason why he got raptured. Yeah. See that? Mm -hmm. He had a testimony. Remember, testimony is part of showing if you have the right faith or not, right? So what was his testimony? That he pleased God. Yeah. That was the very reason. So he got raptured. So then the question is, could it be possible? Maybe we can have that pre-tribulation rapture launching faster if we had Christians today who would really please God. Go to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. But I thought that the world is supposed to, getting, supposed to get worse and worse. Correct. But that doesn't mean you. And by the way, the Bible also says when the world gets worse and worse, that shows Jesus is coming sooner. That makes the rapture launch sooner. So good, let the world become more apostate. That means the rapture will come closer. But then the question is, are you pleasing him more? If you please him more, perhaps that rapture could launch a little faster and the apostasy could just really uh, prove itself. And by the way, how much more apostate can you get, right? So maybe the only thing holding back is your testimony, perhaps? I don't know. So let's start pleasing the Lord. And Revelation 3 indicates this. Revelation 3. Look at verse 10. He's speaking to the church of Philadelphia. The church, right? See that? It can match with us. And this is a doctrinal application to tribulation saints. So basically, for any saint in any dispensation, whether you're Enoch or a tribulation saint or a church age saint, this might be the rule of thumb if you want that rapture to launch for any of those people. Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know what that verse is saying? God's going to give that trial or tribulation upon the whole world, but God will make sure that you get out of that. How about that? What's that supposed to mean? For the tribulation saint, that's their rapture. For us, that's our rapture. How about that? 
So the tribulation saint escapes the wrath of God from the second advent, whereas us, we can escape the tribulation, the seven year where it begins, so we can get a pre-trib rapture. And by the way, Enoch, he lived in a world of apostasy, remember? He lived in a world of apostasy where God drowned it out with the worldwide flood. So Enoch is the perfect picture for us to follow then. Makes you want to live like Enoch now, right? All right, if any of you are sick and tired of this wicked world and want Jesus to come soon, then start living right for God, please, all right? Maybe, just maybe, we're the last ones. You ever thought about that? Think about this. Maybe we might be just the last people to hold that rapture back. So maybe if we start, <laughs> this should get you a little excited. Maybe because we're just conditioned by how wicked this place is, and this is known to be one of the most wicked places. Let's pray to God this is the most wicked place. Yeah, come on. And that we're the only one holding back, and we just have to live right, and then Jesus Christ can rapture us out of here. Amen? Amen, amen. amen, amen. All right. All right, so let's go to verse 6. Now, this is good. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Mark that down. You want to please God? You will never please him if you keep doubting what you're doing. If you always live in confusion. Everybody I counsel, everybody I preach can be traced to this one issue. Uncertainty. Uncertainty in their thinking, uncertainty in their decisions, yeah uncertainty with their emotions, what they're supposed to do. Always confusion. Remember, the devil is the author of confusion. Yeah. If you want to please God, it's impossible when you have zero faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. If you want to come to God, and if you want to have a close relationship with him, You've got to believe, here are two things, that he is. That's very important. The reason why a lot of you doubt in what you're doing or trouble is because you don't believe who he truly is. Now, here's one quick example is, remember I preached to you the Sermon on Grace? Remember how I preached to you about the attributes of God? For some of you, perhaps, was a little bit eye-opening to understand about who God really is, that it gives you more peace and thankfulness for the life you live in. The reason why we're not is because we don't understand who he is. So if we understand who he, who he really is, that he is truly love, that because he really looks after your welfare, he's a beneficial God, that he is truly gracious, if you really understand who he is, what his nature entails, then you would have no fear about the decisions you make or be troubled with the emotions that go through in your heart. But see, it's a lack of understanding who he is. So what would I encourage you is, how, my question to you is, how much do you know that book yeah. about who God is? Yeah. How much have you applied the preaching in your heart knowing who God really is? How good is your walk with him spiritually? The more you know who he is, the more you live in peace. When you go through trials in your life, let's be honest, okay? Unfortunately, trials is where we understand who he really is on how he deals with us in our lives more than our Bible reading and prayer and preaching. You know why? Because we're just stubborn human nature. We don't really change through the preaching of the Word of God. We don't really apply things in our Bible reading and prayer. But when we go through trials, that, then we change our lives, don't we? Why? Because we learn things. We learn things that, oh, this is how the way things are. This is how God works. I had some wrong thoughts, wrong decisions here. Usually it's through trials that we understand more about God, who He is. And after that trial, when we go through similar trials in the future, we're not as troubled and confused, right? Why? Because we have a better understanding now of how God deals with us in our lives. So then we look at our previous trials. Oh, I know how God dealt with me before. It's just the same like back then. So that's why you have more peace with this new trial, right? Because it's the same because... I don't know, was that deep? Are you all understanding? No, uh, okay, I just want to make sure. If you're lost, just tell me. That way I can clarify, because this is very important. 
When you, my point is, if you really understand who he is, it gives you more peace. See that? It strengthens your faith in your walk with him. And I'm trying to give an example of trials because trials, unfortunately, is probably the most clear example that you and I will understand if you ever experience trials. When you and I experience trials, we understand how God deals with us, how, how his timing works, what his will is like, and what he wouldn't do to us and what he would do to us when we undergo trials, right? So that familiarity of the trials we went through with him helps us with the next trial we undergo. When we go to that next trial, we're not as confused or troubled like the previous trial because in this new trial, I've been through this road before. I know what to do, right? Because we've been down this road before, meaning we know how God operates with us with this particular trial. That's what it means. That means we know who he really is. See, we have to understand his nature more. Let it not be through trials alone. Then that means, <laughs> that means you have to go through more trials in. Isn't that something to think about? If you want to know more about God, he doesn't have to keep giving you trials. Why not work on your Bible reading, studying the Bible, doctrine and prayer, and then uh, really apply the preaching, really pay attention to the preaching. And you wonder, the more you skip church services, why are so many bad things happening? You thought about that? Sometimes those bad things happen because God can't teach you in church, so he'll have to teach you in trial. And that is not done out of spite or punishing you for skipping church. It's more done so, so that you can understand who he is. Why? Why, why should I know who he is? You'll need to know that, trust me. If you don't know who he is, then you're going to always remain in confusion, doubt, and fear for the rest of your life. Good stuff, amen? amen. The second thing about faith, diligent search. Yeah. All right, this is the most unpopular one, the most disliked one, but it will be the most blessed one to you. Yeah. All right, the verse says, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, if you want to come to God, see that? You want that closeness with God. It's not just knowing who he is, but also that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He will reward you. He will bless you if you diligently search for him. Okay, now, I want you to go to Acts 21. Acts 21. Acts chapter 21. And I won't be able to cover my favorite point in faith with Abraham. I'll do that next Wednesday. Hopefully I can cover Noah, though, a little bit. Noah has something interesting. All right, go to Acts 21. Now, this is really good. You want to know who God really is? Well, your pastor mentioned about pr uh, the Bible, right? So you hear preaching. That way you get to know God better. You read your Bible. You study doctrines. You get to know God better, right? So that's what Paul pointed out. Who is God? He is by his statement, his word. Acts chapter 21, notice what Paul said. Paul pointed out, Acts chapter, uh, I said 21, excuse me, 27, sorry, 27, 27. I love how the wording is right here. It just goes close with Hebrews 11 about must believe that he is. And that is aligned with his word. Acts chapter 28. And notice right here at verse uh, 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that he hath tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. So Paul knows that all these guys that they're uh, going through a lot of hard times and they're worried, but Paul's assuring them that they could be at peace because of verse 25. Verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I, what? Believe, Believe God. Like Hebrews eleven six, 6, right? Believing God, faith, 
must believe that he is, right? But look at verse 25. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. See that? Even as it was told me. So he believed who God is. By what? Because by what he said. That's what the word, wording pointed out right there, right? I believe what God, I believe God even as it was directly told me. He believes who God really is by just what he told him. You want to know who God is? You got to find out what he told you. What he told you. That's why um, instead of the trial, why not the word, right? right. Instead of the trial, why not the word? All right, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Perhaps trials, I could be wrong, but I think it's very true. Trials can diminish, perhaps, the more you get into that book. But anyway, that's just uh, that's, uh, purely theoretical. A lot of times people who believe and grow in the Word, they go through hard times too, right? Obviously. But who knows? Maybe the Lord, He's trying to teach you who He is because you're not really getting into the Word. So perhaps try that out. Get into His Word. Study. Learn doctrine. You know? Get, uh, go through extra discipleship classes or something. Read books. You know, we have a lot of stuff. Amen. Just know more about our God. Amen. All right, let's look at uh, the last part of verse 6. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I like to give two examples of this. Go to Romans 4 and Mark 9. Romans 4 and Mark chapter 9. Okay, if you're going to have strong faith, it's believing that he's going to give it to you, reward you, bless you, take good care of you as you diligently search out for it. Okay, what's an example of that? Trial is a great example, like I mentioned to you before. A trial is a time where you're really searching. God, what are you trying to do to me? What are you trying to tell me? Isn't that, like I told you, the underlying issue with everything in counseling or preaching that I talked about? See, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to show me? See, you're searching for that. But this search is not something that's given to you on a silver platter. Why doesn't God do that? Well, one is, like I told you before, it could be because you don't really know the word, right? So if you know more about that word, that would save you a lot of trouble. But like I told you before, it doesn't matter how much you know the word, a lot of, uh, we will never understand truly the mind of God, who he is, because God's just so much deeper than us. So during trial, what God wants is not to give you a clear silver platter uh, to you where you get the solution. So no, it's not like you hear preaching and you get the answer and then, oh, thank you, God. First time you might feel that way, but then when the trial gets a little bit more complicated, then you realize Wow, you know, I need that preaching. It did help, but it didn't really help that much. Unless that's just me. I don't know, okay? I don't know if that ever happened to you. You get counseling, and then you're searching for that one answer. No, you don't get it. You don't get it. You know why? Because faith is something where God rewards you. You believe he'll reward you. You believe he'll bless you through diligent search. It's not a diligent search to get a five-second answer. It's not a diligent search if you get it over with in one day. Right. Do you understand that? Faith is something that, re that God sees as diligent search. A diligent search is what makes a good faith. A good faith is not something where you go by instant gratification of Googling a question Googling your problem and you get an answer in 0.5 second so that you can feel better. That's right. Hey, yeah. yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. Oh, I'm depressed. Why? Oh, I have this sickness in my stomach. What's going on? And you, we always get, see what we're built upon? Fleshly instant gratification. And you wonder why we have a faith issue. Yeah. Progress of higher ed and science is what? Lack of faith. That's the a, that's a result of it. You know why? Because we get so much on instant answer, 
instant gratification, something physical, materialistic as our answer, as our evidence, so that it helps us in our faith. No, it just weakens your faith more because you go so much by sight. Faith, how that strengthened is where you need to go, that pressure on your faith, where it's built up. There's actual exercise. Even your flesh needs pressure exercise. Even psychologists admit that stress is good for you because that pushes you to mat maturity. It builds up your maturity rather than constant dependability upon something to give you an answer or help you or feel good. All right? So that's why these things are good for you. Why? Trials are good for you because see that diligent search. So there's that exercise going on. And while that exercise is going on to your faith, it makes it easier to have a mature faith after that. It's not easier to have a mature faith if you constantly get gratified, okay? Then you'll never have a strong faith. This is good, Romans 4. You know what Abraham did? He hoped against hope. That's a good definition of diligent searching. That's a ex good example of faith during darkness when there's no answer, nothing to help. Romans 4, verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations? See, he, get, he believed in that God would reward him and how that's done is by a diligent search. He hoped against hope. You know what search means? Search means I can't find the answer so I need to find it. This is not searching, okay? This is not searching. I don't care what you type down in Google. That's not searching. That's getting your answer like that. You know what searching is? Searching is there's no answer out there, so I need to do something, diligent effort on it. Okay, go to Mark 9. Mark 9. You might say, why, why should I exercise my brain and search for it? Because you're too lazy. Because you're so lazy that uh, your brain uh, is not exercised into operating faith correctly. It's so dumb in a dull state, it doesn't know how to operate faith. So your brain needs some exercising. And that's called trial. That's called hoping against hope. That's called in the darkness, there's no light. That's called when you're in utter depression and no one is able to lift you up. That's what it's called. And that's what you and I exactly need. Amen. Mark chapter 9. I told you it was unpopular, but it's the most, it'll be the greatest blessing as well to you. Go to Mark chapter 9. Here's another example. A person who had no faith, but asked for faith. That's another great example. A person who had no faith, but still searched for it, desperate for it, asked for it. Look at uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Well, he can't believe. Verse 24, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said, With tears. Yeah, that's good. Does that feel like you? That feels like you? Yeah, this is real faith. Lord, I believe. But see, he doesn't really believe. Help thou. Mine unbelief. That's real faith. Real faith is you don't see a materialist evidence with technology helping you, with a scholastic authorities backing you up so that you can trust in it. That's a weak faith. Strong faith is hoping against hope. When there is no answer, there is no visible evidence. And when you feel like there's no faith in you, that's real faith is to take that risk, dare to take a step. And then you'll have more genuine faith more than ever before. Amen. Why? Diligent search. Yeah. Diligent search. Okay, I didn't even talk about Noah. That would have been really good. Okay, so I'll talk about Noah's faith, and this will be very eye-opening. Remember the power of binding and loosing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How you bind the people in their sins is what Noah did, believe it or not. And believe it or not, it has to do with one simple thing, your testimony. Believe it or not, your testimony combined them. Anyway, next Wednesday, all right? 
And then a better one, which I want to cover, was Abraham, not knowing whither he went. A faith that's so strong that you go to some place, you do something that you don't know what's going to happen. Amen. You want to know how to do that? It has to do with these three. So that's even better. So I wanted to talk about it tonight. Ah! So I'll talk about it next Wednesday, all right? Really good stuff. Please don't miss out. You'll really get a blessing. More than what you've heard, all right? This is, those two are better than what you've heard so far. Father God, I pray that, um, I pray that you'll bless us uh, with faith, Lord, for we lack faith. We live in a generation of higher ed, scientific progress. We have such weak faith, Father. And I pray that you'll strengthen our faith, help us to believe in you. I pray that these lessons have been helpful, have been a true blessing to us, and we'll apply them for your glory. Help us to know who you are, Father. The world has painted a dirty, rotten, unfair picture of who you are, Father. And, and we believe it. We Christians believe it. What television says, what scholar says, what atheist said. Lord, we believe it. Is it how sad? Lord, uh, open our blinded eyes. Help us to know who you really are and believe you according to your word, according to the trials you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.